I'm Ryan and today we are going to work on an acrylic landscape lesson. All of the tools and materials will be listed in the video description and if you'd like help with the drawing process I'll have the traceable up over on Patreon. With that said, let's jump into it. We're going to begin here by taking our flat-headed half-inch brush, taking some titanium white, moving that down here on our palette. We're going to use the corner of our brush to grab a hint of blue, not much at all. You can wipe off any excess right here. And I'll use the other corner to grab a little bit of Mars Black. Then we'll throw these three pigments together, get a fairly bright, desaturated, bluish gray, and I'll start applying that right up here in the sky. We're using the flathead brush here because it can hold a good amount of paint. And we're trying to get a nice diffused, almost cloudy light up here. Now, as you can see, portions of my drawing are showing through. So we'll need to go back a couple of times and build this up. Acrylic paints are innately semi-transparent. So when you do a thick underdrawing, generally you'll have to go back in with a little bit more paint. I'm also going over portions of the foliage and I'll just build that back out on top of the sky a little bit later on. But you can tell just how subtle this gray is in comparison to the white. It's really quite bright, but that little touch of Mars black and blue will give it a really nice cloudy effect when we're done. I'm also using the sharp edges of this flat-headed brush to cut along the edges here of our mountain. Give it a really nice clean look and retain as much detail there as we possibly can. Once our sky is finished, we're going to begin working down in the painting and into our mountains. But this is actually quite interesting because generally, when you're painting mountains, you ask yourself, which side of the painting is the light source coming from? Is it over here? Is it over here? Because that is a big effect on how you wrap light around them and how you make them look three-dimensional. If the light source is over here, then all of the left-hand sides of your mountains and the protruding pieces are going to receive a lot of light, and the right-hand sides, because they're opposite to that light source, are going to be very cast in shadow. But we don't have that happening here because the light is very diffused, it's kind of bouncing everywhere, and we're left with a much more subtle light. So how do we create depth in mountains or really any subject in that type of scenario? Well, the, the general rule of protruding subjects continues and still works. And the idea there is just that if a piece of the mountain sticks out, if it protrudes, then it probably is going to be receiving more light and where it kind of sets back in, that's going to be a little bit darker because it can't receive as much light because those protruding subjects are going to cast very slight shadows on it. And that's just a good rule of thumb for kind of diffused settings. So with that, we'll continue working with our uh, half inch flat headed brush and I'll head over here. I'll mix up a gray, with a hint of blue that's a little bit darker than what we just used. So I'm mixing right beside our initial mixture. That way I can see if it's darker, if it's more blue, and just how it's going to work right beside that sky. So I'm slowly just adding slightly darker pigments until I get something I feel works really nicely. I don't want it to be too dark, but I do want it to be a little bit darker. So we'll start with this. And once I first get that paint, I'm going to jump into the top of this mountain and I'm just going to define my edges. And I do this at the beginning because when you have fresh paint on your brush, you have the best chance at creating a sharp defined edge and that's exactly what we want for this subject. That's why this brush is great for this subject. And as you can see, I'm just working my way around creating all of these little ledges. It almost looks like stairs. 
And through these, you'll be able to create a lot of depth. There we go. Once our top area is defined, we can mix a bit more of that pigment. Use a, quite a bit of titanium white, a little bit of Mars black, a little bit of blue, of course. And then we'll start filling that in. Once again, I'm going to go over my foliage and just work that foliage on top of this a little bit later on. I'm also going to go over the entirety of my waterfall and I'll paint that back in in a little bit. Right now we're trying to get a lot of vertical strokes and it doesn't have to be a perfect blend but we want something that's relatively consistent and we want to ensure that because this is our base layer our pigment is quite thick. We don't want any areas of the canvas showing through. Those areas will look a bit Lighter, here you can see the tooth of the canvas. We don't want that, so I'll just move some extra pigment over top. And I'll continue working my way down here to the bottom. But I'm also continuously mixing more pigment as I do this. It's a good habit to get into because it'll ensure that you remember how to mix your pigments the next time you want them, perhaps in another painting. go. Getting into a lot of foliage here. I might apply my paint horizontally like this, but then in the end before it dries I do go back to a vertical stroke to even it out. Once we have the entirety of the mountain covered, I'm switching over to a smaller flat-headed brush. This one's about a quarter of an inch. I wet it with a little bit of water and then wipe off the excess, that way it's damp. This will condense the bristles, make it a bit sharper, and make it a bit better to work with my details. With that, I'm now going to create some details by making a little bit of highlight. So I'm taking some titanium white, Taking a hint of blue, hint of Mars black, and right now I'm looking to create a pigment that's quite similar to what we used in our sky, if not something a hint brighter. And I'm looking for something that might be a little bit brighter because we're applying it on top of a dark layer, and acrylics are semi-transparent, so when we apply it, it'll mix, it'll blend, it'll be a little see-through, and it probably won't look as bright as what we have on our palette. So I'm going to start here on the top because that's where the most light is coming to. And then I'll start working my way down a little bit. I'll create a sharp edge, as you can see. I'll make lots of little taps rather than long individual strokes. That way it looks like there are little impressions in the mountain. And then I go to the back of my stroke and I start blending it backwards very softly. See that? There we go. And that way it looks like light is hitting the protruding areas, the areas that stick out. And then as we move farther back into the mountain, this front area casts a little bit of a shadow and it's a bit darker. We can also go back to the top and make a lot of it quite a bit brighter. I like to leave a little bit of the texture from the brush stroke showing through. That way we get a little bit of a rock-like impression. And I'll go over the top area a couple of times because every time you apply a highlight, you build that base layer to be slightly brighter. And every time you do that, you get a brighter application, even if you're using the same pigment. There we go. Here you can see I'm doing a little bit of a tap with my brush. As I run out of paint, it gives me this slight impression kind of looks like slate rock. I'll apply more pressure with my brush up here, which releases more paint, but 
it makes the stroke a lot larger. When you make a stroke with a lot of pressure, the bristles expand and you get something that's a little bit less controlled but you do release more pigment. So it's kind of about figuring out what you want to do and what you're willing to do to get that paint on the canvas. Here you can see I'm still making all of these very tiny, very soft impressions, which are giving us a little bit of texture. And then you can build up extra little ridges in here, like this one. Not all of it has to be planned from the beginning. You can kind of just let it flow here and there. go. As we move down though, it is important to note that we should progressively let this get a little bit darker because we're moving farther away from the light at the top. I also just wet my brush to take off a little bit of that excess paint and yet again condense the bristles. And that's something I'll do a couple of times in this. You don't want your brush to be fully wet, but you also don't want it to be fully dry. It's all about balance. It's also worth noting, the more wet you have it, the more semi-transparent your pigments will be, but the sharper of a line and stroke you can get. So again, it's a, it's a bit of a trade. It's deciding what you really want in this part of the painting. Sometimes I opt for a significantly sharper, more wet stroke, and then Later on, I just go back in and I do more layers to make up for how thin it is. But sometimes I want a really thick base layer like this, where I won't use any water at all. So I'm changing my initial drawing a little bit, but for those of you who are using the traceable, don't worry. The traceable will be based off the final version of this painting not the initial version. So you'll have it all perfect and ready. That way you don't have to worry about the proportioning or changing anything up. There we go. Yet again, starting from the top, getting closer to the actual waterfall, which is quite fun. This rock is a little bit farther away from this rock, so it's a little bit less detailed. I'm being a little bit more choppy with my stroke. Letting it be a little bit softer. And of course, it's dissipating as we move down. Getting some titanium white, Mars black, a little bit of blue. Remixing those pigments. That way, yet again, we're in the habit of it. And now when I apply this to the top, as I did before, look how much brighter it is. It's not that the pigment's brighter, it's just that I'm applying it over a slightly lighter layer. And so that highlight really has an opportunity to pop now. And again, I'm just applying this to the top, and then as I get farther down, I'm letting it dissipate, I'm running out of paint, as we want to. And now here, it's almost nothing. Might make this a little bit brighter though, just to define the area. Nice. Now the other side is going to have the opposite effect. So, here you can see it protrudes, it's like a step. The area that faces down means that that area is sticking out. And so we'll start this time on that. Similar to what we were doing. But this time, I'm going to blend to the left rather than to the right. 
So here, the right hand side is going to be the highlighted area, and then as you move over here, it gets more shadowy and darker. Though the top as a whole will be brighter than the bottom. Using a really soft technique here, I have a bit more water on my brush, so it's semi-transparent. It's giving me a bit of a different effect, so I'll work that over into these as well. That way it's cohesive, both sides of the painting match. It's nice and symmetrical. I'd also like to note that we're painting a waterfall here today because it was voted for over on Patreon. I put up a little poll asking everybody what they wanted to see. We had, I think, five different options. And people left some really good suggestions for the future, which we will be doing. But I put up a, a traceable of a waterfall, and then I did that painting, and then I realized, you know what? This composition isn't as balanced as I'd like. So this is my second waterfall of the week. It's a friendly reminder that regardless of, I don't know, how, how professional you may be at something, sometimes things just don't work out, and, and that's okay. Not every painting is going to be perfect. Sometimes you'll need to refine, and with this one, I went with a significantly more symmetrical piece. So, you can see the trees on either side, they kind of match each other, same as those. This is all very center-focused, and what's interesting about this composition, it really goes against the rule of thirds, which is a great composition for just generally making sure things are well-balanced. But, what putting your main subjects in the center does, and then framing them, it makes them one of two things, either very high impact, or very stagnant and boring. And we're getting over the stagnant possible issue by incorporating waterfall, which is a moving subject, and then a secondary waterfall, which is another moving subject. So this is just to say that there are pre-established rules in art, there are ideas like the rule of thirds, which I generally work with and I really like, but there are also times when you need to break those ideas, make things your own, because there are really great paintings out there that don't follow the rules. There we go. Creating some lighter areas that are a bit more full, a bit more chunky, you could say, and they look really, really nice. It's a good balance with the more horizontal line work, and again, as you can see, I'm just going in with this very thin pigment that's left on my brush. I'm working my way back because as you work our way back, it should get a little bit darker and darker, and that's exactly what it's doing as we run out of paint. There we go. I think we'll come over here, we'll do a bit more of that technique. Just think it's working exceedingly well. Yes, I am finger painting. Never give up on finger painting. There we are. I just wet my brush again, so as you can see, the bristles are nice and compact, wiped off the excess. Now I'll add a little bit more highlight to the top here. A bit more detail into this one. A little bit of detail into this one. We don't want much because this one, again, is farther away, and we also don't want it really competing with our waterfall. So I'm going to try to keep a lot of the line work in it horizontal now. That way it visually doesn't conflict. And there we go.
So that is what our rock structure should look like at the base of it. Now it's time to actually work on the waterfall. So now, yet again, we are a little bit closer. We're going to be working on the farthest waterfall. I'm going to be using this small flat-headed brush. I'm going to begin by making sure that it's nice and damp because I do want the next applications to be semi-transparent. And the more wet your brush is, the more semi-transparent your pigment will be. So before that though, I am going to make sure that this is dry to the touch. If it's wet, you may accidentally peel off the layers of rock which you just applied and you don't want that. So make sure this is dry first. Then we'll take a hint of blue and I'm going to mix this beside the highlight color that we just made because I want it to be a little bit brighter and a little bit more blue than that, but I still want it to be nice and gray. So here you can see it's more blue, but it's not brighter. So take more titanium white, we'll work that in. I think that's a little bit brighter, it's a little bit more blue, we'll give it a shot. I'm going to begin at the top of the waterfall, make some nice little vertical strokes here, leave occasional openings in the water, that way it looks like it's kind of crashing and bouncing off rock. We're keeping our strokes entirely vertical for this. That way they don't conflict with those around them. As you can tell, as the pigment dries, it gets a little bit more transparent, a little bit darker, which is nice. It'll work as a great base layer here. And we'll bring this down to the bottom. Now, what happens when water falls and hits a base. Generally it tends to mist up a little bit. So we can take this, work in a little bit of a round stroke here, start at the bottom where you have the most pigment, work your way up. Working in these round strokes it'll get softer and softer as you run out of pigment. And if you don't start running out of pigment you can also use your finger to just kind of wipe a little bit off and you get this very soft little misty look at the bottom there. So here we are, yet again, I'm going to take a little bit more of that pigment. This time I'm adding a hint more titanium white. I'll apply it at the very bottom of the waterfall. And then I will just tap in circular motions my way up. And this will create a nice fog cloudy like effect. I'm working it behind this rock right here which protrudes, so we have a little bit of a sharp edge there. And then I just blend upwards until it dissipates into the rock. And that way you have a really nice soft transition with a really soft looking application. Just like that. I am however going to take a bit more of that blue now and just recreate a couple of those vertical lines in it. Because when we do that, we use a lot of water, we spin it around and we can peel the applications of the water we just applied off and we don't want that. So I want to still see it slightly through this fog and mist. There we go. We want our first waterfall to be quite thin and tapered. That way our following ones can progressively get larger. And through that change, we will show depth. There we go. Beautiful. So here's a little bit of a wider shot showing all of this in context with the rest of the painting. And the next thing we are going to be painting which is the follow-up waterfall right down here. Now, to do this, we're going to switch back over to the half-inch flat-headed brush. I'm going to make sure that it's a little bit damp. Then, I have my darker gray that I used here. I want something slightly darker than this because we're moving forward in the painting. We're getting farther away from that light source. And as you get closer to the foreground in a piece, you get a lot less reflective atmospheric light 
and therefore things are much more their innate natural color. So I'm going to start with titanium white. I'll place that right here, it's right beside our initial mixture. I'll get some Mars black. Of course we'll need a little bit of blue because we're still going to get a little bit of that blue light reflecting. Not too much though. We're close, needs to be slightly darker. Just a hint more Mars black. Add very minimal amounts of Mars black every time you go into remix because it's a very strong pigment and it can quickly overtake your mixture, become a lot darker than you intend it to. Now I'll start it at the top here because it'll give me a very accurate reading on if this color is indeed actually darker than this one. I think so, which means we can progress. Just working down vertically in the same way we initially did our mountains, though this will be entirely covered by water. As we get closer to the bottom, I'm going to take a hint of Mars Black, just a little bit, work that into the mixture we're currently using, that way it's slightly darker, and then I'll work my way up with this and blend the two in the middle. And I'm doing this because, again, we're getting farther down in the painting. This is going to cast a shadow on the bottom portion, and we want it to be a little bit darker. And I'll create a nice sharp line for the bottom here. Then I'll work that line back up vertically. Might do a little bit more pigment at the bottom. We had to stretch it a little bit, and generally when you stretch your pigment, it becomes more and more transparent. And remember, this is our base layer. This is something we need to be quite thick. If you find it difficult to continuously reapply pigment because it's just not mixing well, or there might be too much pigment there, just let it dry for four or five to 10 minutes, then come back and it should be significantly easier. Now on the note of letting it dry, I'm actually going to let this dry for about five to 10 minutes. And then I'm going to come in and add our waterfall. I don't want to do it right now because if I did apply those blues and those whites on top of this, they would mix with all of these very dark pigments, be quickly become diluted, a little bit muddy, difficult to work with, and I wouldn't get anything bright or as saturated as I want. It'd be a very different color than what I had on my palette. So we don't want that right now. Take a little break, maybe make some tea, pet the cat, do all that good stuff, and then we'll be right back. So it's been about 10 minutes and our backing here is now dry to the touch. So I am going to use that half inch flat headed brush, make sure that it's a little bit damp, then I'll head back to my palette grab a little bit of blue, put that right beside the initial blue we mixed. I'll grab some titanium white, and here I want to make something that is slightly more saturated and slightly more bright. As we get closer to the foreground, things do tend to look a little bit more saturated. The colors aren't all jumbled like they tend to be in the background. And I think this will be a good start. So to do this, we're going to start by applying it to the top and I'm just going to apply a nice thick layer right up here. And then I'll kind of switch how I'm holding my brush. See now it's kind of upright. I'll drag down, drag down, drag down. And then I'll do that a fair number of times. Sometimes I'll switch my brush head over to the other side where there will be more pigment. And the idea is just that we get it to fall. It will be semi-transparent because the brush is damp, but we want it to be damp so that we can move the paint a bit better. And we essentially want it to be the brightest of the top and then work its way down to being a little bit darker. Now you will have to grab paint a number of times here because as you can see, 
The more we moved it down, the more it stripped it off the top. So we'll just reapply right there. Don't be afraid to take your time with this. It is one of those things that can be a little bit tricky, but we'll get it. I'm also taking the excess paint that I have, when I don't have much, and I'm working it from the bottom up, because it's significantly more transparent, and so you'll see that darker pigment show through much more as you get towards the end. There we go. We are still far from finished though. I'm occasionally going to switch my brush to be vertical, to fill in an area or two, as you can see here. You can also create some larger impressions in the waterfall that are a little bit less consistent with it, should you want to. Now I'm taking all of the paint off my brush by just putting in a little bit of water, wiping off the excess. Now we'll make a slightly brighter variant. So a little bit more white, a little bit more blue. And we're doing this because remember, our first application, visually it's going to blend with that darker pigment underneath because it's semi-transparent. And now we're going to be working on a slightly brighter pigment and that's the, the whole goal here. We're just building up the opacity, the brightness and the saturation of the top and we're letting it dissipate as we move back down. This is another process that can benefit from doing a layer or two and then letting it dry. Because we are using a lot of water, eventually that water can strip a little bit of the paint. So that's actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to let this dry fully, probably five, maybe 10 minutes, and then I'll jump right back into it. This process, again, it could be done quickly by just layering on a lot of paint, doing a big blend, but if you want it to be as right as you can get it, Take the time and, you know, we'll get it. We'll get it just right. So I'll see you in just a second. And yeah. So yet again, it's been a couple of minutes. Our painting is dry to the touch. So I'm going to take my damp flat headed brush, a little bit of that titanium white, a little bit of that blue hint of our Mars black. We don't want much, but just a little bit. Maybe a little bit more. Yeah, and we'll try that. As always, starting at the top. And every time we do this, it should get a little bit brighter because we are building highlights on highlights. And then I'll blend it down softly. I'm not using much pressure. If little bits of the brush stroke show through though. That's not a bad thing because the bristles will look like little bits of moving water little streams of it. Great. Make it a little bit brighter yet again. Head to the top. And you see how we're just slowly, slowly building this. It's not meant to be done in a single layer. And I'll let that top area be quite bright. It will almost look like a line. And then we'll move into our gradient of strokes. Generally, it's best to take paint from the top and move it down, by the way. Otherwise, you might get streaks in the middle. We don't want that. Now how bright or dark you make this is entirely up to you. I think that the top there is really just what I want it to be. I think the bottom could be a little bit darker. So I'll take a little bit of our blue, move that off to the side of our highlight, that way we can compare them. Take some extra Mars black, a little bit of titanium white. Now I'll try applying this from the bottom. <laughs> 
feel like it just gets better and better. It's exactly what we want. It still has a lot of gray in it, which is quite nice. Doesn't stand out too much. And we don't want it to because of course, we don't have a lot of blue in the sky, so we don't want too much blue in the waterfall. Finally, I think we'll do one more highlighted application right at the top of that waterfall. Not going with the first mix I mix, adjusting it until I have what I actually want. Applying that, blending down. I said the final mix, doing a little bit more. Taking that very almost white, applying it to the top. Doing a slight little movement, not much. And I think there we have it. That's what I want. Perfect. So again, here's a little bit of a wide shot just to give you some additional visual context as to how all of these values kind of relate to each other, how this bluish gray is brighter than the bluish gray in the water, but how the sky is really the brightest thing in the piece still. You generally want your water to be slightly darker, if not significantly darker than the sky, and that's just a good rule to work off of. With that, we're now going to jump right down here into the water that is coming about from the waterfall. So now we're down at the bottom and this amount of space is fairly similar to this amount of space. So we're going to want to continue using the medium sized flat headed brush. I'm going to mix up a little bit of a darker blue than what we used at the bottom here. So actually work on top slash right beside our mixture for that, that way I can use it as a reference. There we go, it's a good start. And yet again, I think I'll make it even more blue. So we'll just start working those together till we have what we want, and I'll give this a shot. This time I'm working in horizontal lines, as you can see. We'll blend it slightly over the foliage on the edges. And because this is closest to us, it's going to have the most saturation, which is just fine. It'll make it pop well in the foreground. Now I didn't do a thick base layer for this, like I did with this waterfall and this one. So we need to ensure that our pigment is quite thick and that we're going over areas that we may feel are a little bit thin, which is what I'm doing right now. There we go. Head back to my palette, mix up a bit more. Don't need that much Mars Black. A little bit of Titanium White. Titanium White is a very thick pigment and it's going to make your pigments need significantly less layering. So it's nice when you can kind of throw that in there, especially to a base layer. The more layers you add, the more natural it'll look because you won't have the canvas showing through. Hope that's a good example right there. There we go. Nice and glassy at this point. But it's time to give it a little bit of dimension and depth. So here, we'll switch over to the smaller flat-headed brush. Make sure it's nice and damp. We'll grab a little bit of titanium white, a little bit of our blue. Mix up a nice highlight similar to that of our waterfall. 
and we'll create some line work moving horizontally to show that there's movement in the water. I'm going to make these quite thin to begin with. Occasionally they'll connect a little bit. I'll make it rather bright here at the back because we'll have a lot of movement in the water and that movement will look quite bright. So I'm doing a lot more blending back here than I am in the foreground. There we go. Get a bit more of that. See now it looks like it's almost connected. And that'll happen as you build it up. As we move closer to us, you can see I'm leaving space between these strokes. And I'm trying to taper off the edges so they blend very softly into the background, but the middle might remain a little bit more opaque. Perfect. Really beautiful. You ever do a painting and it just just goes so much better than you expect or you want it to initially? That's this painting for me. I love that. Get a little bit more blue, a little bit more white. There we go. I think we need it to be slightly more blue. You can work this on top of our previous application. And we're starting to get this brighter mixture here in the foreground, not because the mixture itself on the palette was brighter, but because this underlayer started to dry. So we're working pigment on top of pigment instead of pigment into pigment. So it's not blending in the same way that it was initially and therefore we get something a bit brighter. It's still not as bright as what we have on the palette because it's semi-transparent, but it's interesting to see the different stages and effects you can have by blending wet into wet and wet into dry. Brilliant. Really, really nice. I think I'll connect a couple of these as so we get closer to us. There we go. And it looks like this edge could just use a little bit more along with this one. If you feel like at any point it gets a little bit too bright, you can just work that darker pigment back into it. But it's not, not always necessary. You can also make some of these applications more thick in the foreground. Like that. I generally take the back of it, I blend it back, and then I connect it to another. See that? So now our water is entirely dry to the touch and I'm going to switch over to my smallest brush. This one's about an eighth of an inch and it has a round edge, which is great because it means it doesn't have any sharp points.
and it's really good for delivering soft applications like that of Mist. So we're going to do this next. I'm going to make sure that this brush is relatively damp. Then I'll take a little bit of titanium white, move that right beside our blue, that way we can see what we're working with. I want this to be quite bright. I want it to be a little bit gray. You can see I'm continuously just adding more and more white to our mixture here. Grab a hint of Mars black, very, very small. And then I'll take this, I'll apply a bit of it to the bottom of the waterfall, just like that. I'm going to wipe off the excess pigment on a little cloth, dampen my brush, and then I'm going to come back up, I'm going to go to the top of that application, and I'm going to swirl my brush like this, tiny little swirls, different heights, and I'm just going to build up the mist here to the point where it fully dissipates and becomes just about transparent. Till we run out of it. Then I'll do a little bit of blending at the bottom. Outwards. That way it's soft on all sides. And that's really what we want here. We want a very soft looking aesthetic. That's why we're using a soft brush. That's why we're using so much water. Now I'll head back to my palette. I'll grab a bit more of it. I'll apply it right in the middle here. I'll make this area a little bit more opaque than the rest. And by making this more opaque, it'll make everything on the edges look softer. I'm skipping little areas once in a while. We can have that work its way onto the edge if we want. And if you find you do have too much pigment, you can just use your finger. Again, never give up on the finger painting. And then I'll do a couple little pieces that are extended out. That way it looks like it drifts. Gives it a little bit more dimension. But as a whole, I'm very, very happy with that. So now, I think we can actually get into the trees. Now for our next step, I'm going to go back to a flat-headed brush of about half of an inch, and I have two right here. This one is fairly new, this one is a bit old. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you're probably familiar with this guy. But what we're going to do, we're going to take one of them, and you could just use a new one. We're going to take the bristles, and we're going to peel them back. Just like that. Now you see how they all kind of shoot out in different directions? When we apply paint to the tips of these, and then we tap on the canvas, each of these little tips will leave a different impression and it'll create a lot of detail really quickly and details that are just so incredibly small, smaller than what we could have rendered normally with a regular brush or tap. So this can be done with any flat headed brush. I like to use synthetic brushes, but you can also play with it. You can taper it in a little bit more. If you add water to it, it'll almost fully condense and look like this one again. So avoid water through this process as best you can, but if you do find you get paint all the way down here, then do clean your brush, dry it really well, and then peel it back again. With that said, when we're doing this, try to make sure that the paint only touches the tips of the bristles. You don't want it working its way down. That will make it relatively difficult to work with. So with that, let's talk about color. So here on my palette, I have this sap green, and this is going to be the main green for our foliage. I'll begin by simply taking a good amount of it, and I'm using my other flat-headed brush, because when you mix with your paint, you tend to get a lot of paint on the bristles, and you don't want a lot of paint on the bristles of the other brush. So I'm going to take quite a bit of our green here. I'm going to take a little bit of our titanium white, a little bit of our Mars black, 
And right now we want to mix up a relatively light but also desaturated green. So we're going to desaturate it with a combination of white and black because they mix to make a gray. And we're going to use more titanium white than Mars black to make it brighter than darker. And I'm going to make this relatively consistent. Once I have what I want, I'm going to just take the excess off this brush, I'm going to put that down, I'm going to pick up the other flathead brush, make sure the bristles are expanded in the ways you want them to be. Then I'll just tap on to the tops of those bristles. I'll head to the edge here and then I'll start that movement and that tap. See that? And this is the technique we're going to be incorporating for the majority of our foliage. I'm regularly going back and I'm also rotating my brush as you can see throughout the process. That way my applications are consistently different. They're inconsistent, which makes them look organic and natural. Here you can see we're moving it out into this area. I'm not rushing, taking my time. And I'm just trying to get the edges right now. I'm not working my way inwards. We'll use a different technique for that in just a second. If your paint is thin, you'll see a divide between the new green on top of the rock and then the white. So just go back and grab some additional pigment and thicken that up. There we go. Of course we can move it over a waterfall a little bit. You can also get acrylic sponges that'll do this quite well. I personally like to use the brush. I just feel like it gives me a good amount of control. But you do have different options if you don't want to do this to a brush. The beautiful thing about this though with brushes is that you can use just an old brush that you wouldn't have used otherwise, or you can just use a really, really cheap brush. It doesn't need to be of great quality. You can also see that there are little impressions up here now, and those kind of look like leaves falling off and flying away in the sky, which is really, really dynamic and beautiful. Once we have that base applied, I'm going to take the other flat-headed brush, mix up a bit more of this green, a lot of green, a lot of titanium white, not too much Mars Black. It's a little bit brighter, it's a little bit more desaturated, so we'll add extra black, we'll add extra green, and that looks quite close to our color. So from there, I'll take this. And I'll just work our way around the background foliage. I'm looking at the drawing that I did. I'm avoiding a lot of it in the foreground. I'm using the sharp edge here to work my way around our tree, as you can see, all of our branches. And I'm trying to do a relatively smooth blend with a lot of this. I don't want too many brush strokes showing through because we will be going back relatively soon and incorporating lots of texture and movement on top. And I don't want them to conflict. Move over here, do more of the same. I'm going over the trees in the background and I'm leaving the big ones in the foreground and I'm doing that because the ones in the background are less necessary for composition and we can kind of come up with those later when we want to when we need to but the ones in the foreground I'd really like to stay where they are 
Of course, if you're using the traceable, you could cover it and then just resketch it using that. But to make this easy, I'm going to avoid it. Yet again, that sharp edge really working so well around our branches. And then I get this foliage up here on the top, which is quite similar to that of the bottom in that it's closer to us. I want it to be darker. I want it to be more saturated. So I'm going to avoid that as a whole. I'm also making sure that my pigment here is quite thick because this is our base layer. Now things are going to get interesting as we move to the left and right hand side. So as I move farther this way, I'm going to be using the pigment that I had, but I'm also going to slowly incorporate slightly more Mars Black and darken it just a little bit. Because the farther we move to the left on this side, the darker our pigments are going to be because there's going to be more and more shadow cast in this area. Over here, it's quite open. It can receive a lot of light, but back here, that simply isn't the case. And so to make it look three-dimensional, we need to make sure that it's reacting well with the shadow. So I'm taking a little bit of this darker green and mixing it slowly. That way, but I'm going to move it predominantly to the left. We'll mix, again, a bit of a darker green. Doing it on top slash beside our previous green. That way I can use it as a reference. There we go. That looks great. And yet again, we're just incorporating those same techniques we used before. Lots of little branches in there. Want to keep and protect. And you know what? I might, I might make this a little bit darker too. This is a little bit closer to us. So it can be darker here despite being farther out. Because the closer something is to us, the more of a contrast it'll have. And I'd like to know, while I'm working these edges and I'm not using the older flat-headed brush that kind of spirals out, I'm rotating my brush still so that I get these different impressions on the edges which could be interpreted as leaves. See that? I don't want to take too much of your time as we kind of work through this repetitive process. So I think I'm going to finish up this side with this darker pigment. I'll go and do the right hand side and then we will talk about incorporating a lot of detail in all of it. So I'll see you in just a second. While I was doing the other side here, I decided to take the sharp edges that I had over here and just start dabbing them on with a lot of that really thin paint, that leftover pigment that we had from over here. And it's giving me a lot more of a soft look and I really, really like it. So I'm doing that now over here. And an example is just taking a bit more of that dark pigment like that. And then very softly, I rotate my brush. I kind of tap it, move it out towards the lighter areas, creates all of these different little impressions and it looks significantly more natural. Now this is an effect we'll really start to achieve with the other brush, but this is a, quite a nice starting point. You can see just how well it moves around and all of the extra texture it provides. So I highly recommend doing this with just a very small amount of paint, and it's generally best when you're just about, just about running out on your brush and you can build that up as much as you want. But I think that's quite good for now. Again, most of this detail will be done with the other brush.
So, as you can see, the edges are now done, and we're going to start moving into the bottom left and right hand corner. I'm still going to be using this larger brush, but what's going to be changing is our palette. We're now going to be using a lot of our sap green and a good amount of our Mars black with only a hint of titanium white. So I'll just grab a little bit with the corner, mix that in, and we progressively, as we move forward into the foreground, we want to make our pigment more saturated, which means we need less of a gray mixed in our pigment. And remember that gray occurs when you have white and black in the mixture. So we have significantly less white, which is going to make this significantly more thin. You can actually see the canvas showing through on these strokes. And so we'll have to do a couple of layers, but this is going to be significantly more saturated and I'll work around some rocks that I have with some sharper strokes, as you can see here. That way you know where those are. And then the rest is kind of just applying it in that same way we've been doing. I'll work around that one. But as we get back here, we want to change things again. We want to take a lot more Mars Black and give it almost a silhouetted look going to give it a bit of a vignette effect. If we darken all of the corners in our painting, the eye is going to be drawn towards the middle because the eye naturally goes to the brightest point of any piece. And it's just a really good way of directing the eye. Now, eventually we'll need this to mix with that. So, you know, we can just grab more green, work that in here, avoiding my trees, of course. Like that, but I do want the majority of this to be quite dark. Go back and work on the trees in a little bit. Now, I think this is also a great lesson because look at the difference between this area and this area. This area right here looks very beginner-esque. It looks like what you'd achieve generally when you are starting to paint. Before you start mixing with blacks, whites, and grays, and you make these more muted but mature colors. This is very saturated, and the pigments are thin. You can see the canvas showing through. And this isn't what we want in the end, but it is what we need in the meantime. So it's something we'll build on. And this is actually already started to dry a little bit. So I can just take more of that green, more of that black, or start it on the edge. And I'll work my way up. It's not a pure black. None of this is a pure black. But it's relatively close. There we go. We'll just build this up until we get a nice thick layer. Still rotating my brush in the same way I did these. Then I'll get a little bit more green, make a bit of a brighter mixture, maybe use a hint more titanium white. Not too much, but a bit more. And I'll work this around the edge. Because this edge protrudes, it'll catch more light. So we want this edge to be actually a hint lighter than the back of this. We're moving farther away from the light, but this is all cast in shadow from the edges, and this protrudes so it doesn't have as much shadow on it. So we do want something a little bit brighter. Again, we don't want to use too much titanium white, but we can use a little bit. And yet again, we blend this back. It's really just going to be a process of trial and error until you get exactly what you want with the layers as thick as you want. 
There we go. Starting to see some of that texture build up. Trying to make sure there aren't any vastly bright areas and then vastly dark. So I'll just re-pick up that paint and move it about. And I'm loving the back here. exactly what I wanted. Now yet again we're back at the front and I'm going to take my brush I'm going to clean it in a little dish of water I'm going to wipe off the excess that way we're not continuously mixing with those very dark pigments. I'm going to grab some of our green a little bit of our titanium white not too much I'll apply this along the edge. You can see it's a bit more saturated, but not too saturated. And the more you move it out, the less saturated it'll get, and the less bright it'll get, because it'll mix with more and more of our darker pigments. If you accidentally make it a little too bright or consistent, you can always take more of that dark and work it back in. But with that, I'm now going to continue doing this process right over on the other side of the painting. And then I will see you when it's time to do the next step. So while I was at doing this bottom right hand corner, I decided to do the top left and the top right as well because they're done with the same techniques. And I didn't want to finish these two, start working on something else, go back up to do these two, and then end up with a different color or value. I figured I already had all of my mixes from this and this on my palette, and this needed those same mixes. So we went up, we did this, it's going to make working on the trees a little bit more complicated later on, but I think it was worth it and it was a fair trade. With that, we are now going to head right down into our rocks right here and here, then we'll probably do the trees, then we'll probably add all of that extra detail into our surrounding area. So let's, let's tackle it. So down here we have one, two, three, four definitive rocks and we're going to start by creating some light values on the side that is closest to the light and then we're going to add some dark values on the other side because the light's going to hit this side of the rock, wrap around it, then there's going to be shadows and that darker area will kind of blend in with our greens. So I'm going to use that same medium sized flat headed brush. I'm going to take some titanium white just like that. I'm going to take a hint of Mars Black, mix up a nice bright gray to begin with. Give that a go. Create my sharp edges, which is generally pretty easy when you have some clean paint on a flat headed brush. I'll apply that to a side. I'll move over to this one. I'll apply that right there. Same goes for this. I'm doing them all at once because we have the pigment and we might as well. Then I'm going to take some Mars Black, mix that in, and work right behind that gray. Slight hops and little blends. There you go. See we're darkening all of that gray. That's why we went with such a light gray to begin with because as soon as you start blending in those darker pigments, it's really going to get muted and darkened fast. And I'm going to try to jump between them relatively quickly before that initial light layer fully dries. There we go. Now we'll grab additional black, work that in. You can see it's still not a pure black, it's just a darker gray. 
apply this at the bottom, work it up, little taps at the corner of the brush to create little impressions. I really like blending rocks wet into wet, I just feel like it looks much, much better. So I do try to catch all of this before it dries. Now in the process we will be overlapping a lot of our foliage which we'll have to go back in and fix up, but that's okay. That's generally like why you layer your background to foreground so you don't have to go back and paint over things over and over again, but again I think it was worth it in this scenario. So there we have some pretty easy well rendered rocks. Then to fix up the bottoms we're just going to take some of our green, a little bit of our Mars black, a little bit of our titanium white, probably more Mars black. And then we'll tap that at the bottom, rotating the brush, just making it look like that green is overlapping the rock so that it looks nice and three-dimensional. And just like that, it's all better. Perfect. Now, let's go ahead and do that over on the other side. So, yet again, we'll start with a lot of titanium white. We'll mix in a little bit of Mars black to make it a gray. Go ahead and work on those edges. Nice and sharp. Using the corner of my brush to make little different details and protrusions. Trying not to make them perfectly straight. There we go. We'll make it a little bit darker by mixing in slightly more Mars Black. Work that right behind. A little tap here and there. Lots of blending. Good so far. Now we'll make it significantly darker. Now sometimes if you use a lot of pigment in the first two applications, the darkest application, the one that I'm doing right now, won't look all that dark because it'll continuously blend with these lighter pigments and it'll never get truly dark. So in this scenario, we'll actually have to go back in and do an extra layer. But that's not too hard. Honestly, the more layers you end up doing, the better it will look, the more dynamic it'll be, the more three-dimensional it'll be, the more little textures and pieces it'll have. But again, the thing that I like to watch out for is, is it drying? Because as soon as it starts drying, I know I won't like that blend as much with the rocks, at least rocks in the foreground. I really like the wet on dry look in the mountain, so it, it depends. Every rock structure is different. We're going to take a bit of our mid-tone to highlight and work that back over this edge just started to dry a little too much, so now I'm moving that highlight back in. Get more of that darker value. Work that in the back. There we go. Now we'll switch to our green. And make sure you wipe off your brush first before you switch to the green. Otherwise, it'll be a little difficult. Mars Black, a little bit of Titanium White. Head in from the back. Lots of these little taps. Just work that green into the rock. That way it doesn't feel like there's a hard stop. And that means the front of the rock, the edge of the rock that's facing the light, it'll be nice and sharp. And then the back of it won't be at all, which is really nice. It'll make it look very defined and inset as well. So there we have our rocks. I think it's time we grab some burnt umber, apply that to our palette,
and then start working on our trees. Yet again, here's our wide shot. I am still using that half inch flat headed brush. This time, however, I have a lot of burnt umber on my palette here. We're going to use a little bit of it, not too much, because I really like the muted look of the painting and I don't want to introduce a third saturated pigment. So I'm going to take quite a bit of Mars Black. I'm going to take a bit of that burnt umber, hint of our titanium white, and I'm going to create a dark base layer for our trees. I like to start on the edges and I make multiple strokes rather than a single continuous stroke. That way there are little bumps and protrusions on the tree. This is going to make it significantly more interesting, natural looking. And again, I always start on the edges because that's when I have the most clean, crisp paint. Something that's really important to consider is that your tree should always be tapering as it moves upwards. It should have the widest base and then get smaller and smaller and smaller as you get higher and higher. Once you have the edges applied, you can go in and start working on the body like this. I try to make sure all of my strokes are vertical. That way, if any strokes show through in the final piece, it looks like little bits of bark moving upwards. And my brush is a little bit damp right now, so my pigment is thin. And I'll have to go through and do a, another layer because you can still see portions of the bright canvas showing through here but I'm trying to get it as thick as I can. And my brush is as damp as it is because I wanted to create these really sharp lines here in our branches. So I'm just going to go ahead, fill in our four larger trees, this one, this one, this one, and this one, and then we'll progress together. So I filled in my trees with some nice thick dark pigment and this next layer can happen while this is either wet or dry. Just recognize that if it's still wet, all of your pigments that you are about to apply are going to become a little bit darker, a little bit more desaturated. And it's really up to you if you want this to really pop or if you want it to be a little bit more subtle. Mine is in the process of drying as you can see by just how reflective it is. So I'll get something kind of in the middle and I'm okay with that. I'd actually like something a little more subtle. So I'll start by taking some burnt umber, figure out where the, where the camera's looking, right there. Take some burnt umber. I'll take a little bit of titanium white, mix those together. Then I'll get some Mars black, not too, too much, but enough. And I'll mix a nice grayish dark brown, maybe a little bit more, a little bit more black. Again, I want it to be nice and subtle. We could go with a bright brown, we could go with a saturated brown, but I think what I want is this. So I'm going to approach the edge of my tree here, and I'll just do some tapping. You know what, I'll do it over here as well, that way it's a little bit closer to you. And I'm just doing a little bit of a tap along the edge of the tree. It's going to look like a lot of pieces of bark are being raised and they're catching light, and then the area right behind the tap is more so shadow. And I'm doing this on the left-hand side of the trees on the right-hand side of the painting because the light is coming down towards them here. On the other side, it's the opposite. We're applying it to the right-hand side of the trees on the left side of the painting. And I apply it to the edge, and then I work my way back. I let it slowly dissipate and run out. At this point, you can see I'm applying almost nothing, and that's exactly how I want it to look. Just incredibly subtle. We can make something a little bit brighter. Take a hint more titanium white, burnt umber, bit more burnt umber, bit more burnt umber. There probably a good look. And you can apply this and this will be much more of a standout. Try to get these to look rather small 
The smaller you get them to look, the larger the tree itself will look. You could also switch to a smaller brush for this process if you wanted to. Kind of jumping back and forth between trees, that way I don't kind of become too set in my ways. I don't want to create too much identical pattern in the same areas. So by jumping around, I kind of force myself to do a hard reset. There we go. And we'll do that to our back trees as well. Once we're fairly happy with that, I'm going to work on the smaller trees in the distance. And for those, here's the darker brown that I used. I'm going to make it a little bit brighter, but also more gray. And we're doing this because it's farther away. It'll have a bit more reflective light on it. Speaking of reflective light, look at that. You can barely see it. There we go. And now we'll apply this right here in the back. Still making those tiny strokes, trying to make my tree as small as I possibly can, and then if I want it to be wider, I'll make it wider in a second or third application. But it's much easier to make trees wider than it is to make them smaller, so I always aim to make them smaller to begin with. Trying to create some different little branches, make it interesting. You know what, I think I will make this one a little bit bigger. And then behind it, we'll grab slightly more Mars Black, work that into our mixture, and we'll apply this on the backhand side. Give it a little bit more depth, but not as much as our other trees have. And as you move farther back into the painting with your trees, you generally want to give them less and less of a contrast. There we go. Now we're going to jump right back into this in our foliage here. But yet again, I don't want to use this brush to mix it, so I'll use this one. Starting with a good amount of our sap green, quite a bit of our titanium white. We'll mix up something really bright here. And then we'll grab a hint of Mars Black because we don't want it to be too saturated. So now we'll just bring this right back down. I think that's a really nice mix. So I'll set that brush down, grab the older one, take some of that on the bristles, and then I'll start tapping this along our edges here, and then eventually I'll work it back just a little bit. Now this is how we're really going to get a lot of those details in there, because you can see little openings in between all of these applications, and that's going to give it the illusion of depth, like all of these little pieces are popping out, they're catching all this light, but then there are so many underneath that aren't. And that's what makes it so interesting. So yet again, like the first time, I'm applying it, I'm rotating my brush, and I'll let it dissipate as I move back into the darker areas. Trying to start on the edge, if not a little bit farther more into the middle than the edge, because I actually want the majority of the edge to be bright, not the initial middle tone slash darker tone. There we go. We do the same thing on the top, and it's really quite noticeable up here. I think I'll, I'll zoom in for this part. So now we are significantly higher Again, I'm starting 
on the edge and I'm working my way inwards. And this is the light just catching the edges of this greenery. And when I get to different areas, I'll make this kind of a cluster so the edge is bright. And then I'll make another highlight right there, kind of implying that this itself is another cluster. And then maybe I'll make another one right down here, like this. So these aren't technically necessarily on that edge, but they stick out so they still get that really nice light. I also still need to go back in and do this highlight right here. It is okay to move this over portions of your tree that's actually going to make it look significantly more three-dimensional because the foliage doesn't just exist behind your tree, it's also in front. So here is an area where I'll really go over portions of my tree. I'll build this out and then I'll blend back, but it's not a traditional gradient blend, it's a tap blend and it's just one that lets that pigment dissipate. And this is really where the magic happens. I try to go over just about every part of it, but in the back where I want it to be much darker, I wait till I have almost no pigment on my brush and then it's just this very subtle little implication there. Yet again, I have a lot of pigment, so I'm starting on my edges. And then I say, okay, you know what, we can do an edge right here. And now that I don't have much, I can work my way inwards again. And maybe put a little bit in front of our tree. I'm not pressing too hard, otherwise the bristles would expand as the brush was pushed. They would go out like that and they create a lot of little streaks. So make sure that you're being fairly delicate in the process. You can probably hear the canvas and the easel rattle a little bit from the tap, but it really isn't a hard press. And that's important. Now I'm heading back down here and I'm just going to do more of the same. So it's tapping, it's rotating, it's working on the outer edge, and then it's moving inwards a little bit. Now here we need to be a little bit careful because we don't want to go over the sharp edge of the rock. We can go over the back of the rock though. See that? Same goes for right here. Wanted to avoid that sharp edge, but this back area it's entirely fine. If not, good. And yet again, just so, so much more depth so quickly. Really love this technique. Feel like I got a little bit too much paint right there, so I'm just scraping that off. There we go. Grab a little bit more, head over to this side. There's a separation between this landmass and this landmass, so I'm trying to make that relatively apparent by making that edge quite a bit brighter. This is our foreground. It's going to be much more noticeable. It's going to be much more detailed. Loving how this is turning out. Remember to get behind your rocks. You can even have little bits of this kind of working its way up the tree. Maybe it's a bush. Pretty interesting. And then of course, we do need to work our way back into these middle areas, which I did get a little distracted from, but that's okay. Now, because these have innately lighter values, these highlights aren't going to pick up to that same extent. 
and that's okay. We don't want as much contrast back here, otherwise we wouldn't get all of the nice contrast and the pop that our foreground has. So you need some areas to be more subtle for others to really be special. So there we have the details in the trees, rather the final details in the trees, and I'm really happy with how that turned out. So we're going to call this version right here, this is the beginner version. I think it's great if you're just getting into acrylics, a lot of different good techniques there. But if you'd like to continue working on the piece with me, I will be doing an intermediate to advanced version up over on Patreon where you can also get the traceable. I'll leave a link to that in the description. But with that, I'm really happy with this piece as is. I do see things we could kind of add to it and we will go and do that next. But I really appreciate the, the time we spend here today. I feel like we, we made something that is really, really quite good. And I'm really glad I ended up redoing this because again, I did do a waterfall piece just the other day. It didn't turn out the way I wanted and it just goes to show that not every piece is going to and that if you just you keep trying, you will make something you're, you're really happy and proud of. So I hope you enjoyed. I will see you next week with a brand new painting lesson or in just a minute up over on Patreon with part two of this. It'll probably be another hour, maybe hour and a half of detail work and that sort of thing. So go check that out if you're interested, but this was a pleasure, remember? But this was a pleasure. So thank you so much for stopping by. As per usual, my eBooks on acrylic painting and all of that will be also linked in the description along with the Facebook page and all of the different areas you can kind of and all of the different areas you can kind of connect with me on. So I'll see you soon, and above all, as always, stay creative.